Hi there, my name is Jesse Johnston, and I'm the Senior Research Development Officer at the University of Michigan, and I will be narrating this presentation entitled Grants Projects 101. This is a, intended to be a general overview to basic concepts and things that you want to think about if you're considering applying for a grant. Uh, it was developed for an audience of master's students and uh, faculty who work on artistic projects and performance projects at the University of Michigan. Um, however, it may be of interest and um, informative to anyone who is looking for a grant and wants to consider how they might work their expressive project into a bigger uh, concept by receiving a grant. So let's get started. This presentation is put together by me, but it is made available freely under a Creative Commons license and you are free to um, use, draw upon, or uh, cite any of the information here, although I do ask that you give credit. Keep in mind that any images or other items that are available or you see depicted uh, in the slides here uh, may be under their own individual copyrights, so please don't take this as a copyright permission or claim in the presentation. Um, but the ideas and the way that they're are compiled here are from me and available under this license. As I said, my name is Jesse Johnston. I am the Senior Research Development Officer at the University of Michigan, and most of my work at uh, the university is in the arts and humanities areas. Um, my background is in the humanities as a musicologist, so I work in music uh, and performance in the arts, as well as in scholarship. Um, I worked as a funder uh, at, the, in, at the National Endowment for the Humanities at the federal level for about five years um, and have been in various roles in academia for about 15 years. So I've seen the um, grants and uh, performance ecosystem from a lot of different viewpoints. Um, I've also worked at the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian and worked on programs at the National Science Foundation. So I draw pretty heavily on some of those projects that are coming out of those federal grant areas. This presentation is going to start with an overview of some general suggestions and tips for anyone who's applying for grants. Um, then we're going to take a look at the different types of funding that may be available for people working in the arts. And finally, I'll talk about some specific opportunities that may be available to you in the arts and things that you want to think about that are specifically appropriate for performance-based or expressive projects and um, how to think about those considerations for your grant application. This introductory slide uh, gives you a kind of general orientation to the presentation, but it also, I think, starts with a, a, an idea that may be one that um, changes throughout this presentation. On the left may be what you think you want or what you think you're going to get from grants. Um, everybody wants to get more money, more support for their project, right? You want to be the person who's um, getting the award at the banquet or um, having their work uh, celebrated in some way by a funder. That's the good part, and that's where we all want to get to. But getting there is actually quite a lot of paperwork and putting together a lot of detailed um, work presenting a description of your work generally at least in part in prose in writing that is and then submitting it to a funder appropriately getting it through their review process and finally getting to where you want to go here symbolized by the map um, leading to the university of michigan but in this case um, probably taking you to a funded project Part of the idea behind this session is to demystify the process of grant writing and seeking. There is a set of knowledge and skills that you can use to, to take good idea, ideas and projects to present them in the most compelling light for a funder. Uh, sometimes grant uh, people who work in grants or in foundations call this grantsmanship. Um, I prefer not to um, focus on the grantsmanship idea, but I definitely think that the skills uh, for applying for grants are, are things that you can learn. And although they don't guarantee success, they are going to streamline the application process and increase the odds of success. So the idea here is that there is a process 
you can learn it, and that will help you toward getting funding from a funder. In the arts and humanities in particular, however, remember that um, unlike in science and medicine grants, say, the funding amounts are generally quite a lot lower, so the payoff is generally smaller in dollar amounts. Um, I only share that information with you to underscore the idea that you have to understand the process of the grant that you're seeking, because without that, it's impossible to put together a really strong application. And in a situation where the funding is already limited, a strong application is the baseline of where you have to start in order to move toward finding funding. I also want to um, add to that idea of grantsmanship and understanding the process that you really need to understand the grant process of a specific program and the process of a specific funder. This is particularly important in the arts for the reasons that I just outlined. Um, not only do you need to understand the general process of grant making or, or applications to a fellowship program or applications to a residency, you need to understand the specific processes, um, understand the expectations of a given discipline or a funder or the nature of research that they want to support and to understand how to make the case effectively to them and to communicate it within the rhetorical space of a grant application so that you are successfully telling them this project matters and these are the reasons that you should support it. So understanding the funder specifically allows you to do that. There is a general uh, field of grantsmanship, but you have to understand those particular flowers, each one of those programs or funders that you might be interested in approaching. And the final general advice here is um, that you should consider, particularly if you're familiar with ac academic writing, that you'll be writing for a different purpose than for publication. If you've ever prepared research for publication, say in a journal or in another format that is text-based, um, remember that if you're working on a grant, you're going to be writing for a different purpose than for publication. So the top suggestion that I have here is to think of your application materials as presenting a service to the funder. You're not writing an article to serve your individual research agenda or even your discipline. You're actually presenting it to the funder to say, this is work that can, can happen to um, forward your mission and your goals. So if you think about, for example, the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the primary federal funder in the United States of arts projects, you want to show them that the audience that your work will serve is um, one and and doing the project that you're proposing to do will strengthen the arts and humanities in the United States. It must be a wise use of taxpayer dollars and it must advance access to or understanding of the arts within American society. So you don't want to seem obsequious, but you have to have a writing style that's going to convince the readers of the value of the project and how it will advance their mission. We'll talk about a few more ways to do that um, as we go through the presentation. Before looking at specific programs, I want to take a moment to talk about some specific types of funders and types of um, organizations that you might be looking toward to receive funding. There are a lot of different types of funders, and the type of funder can influence the priorities of the, uh, of the programs that are offered and also influence the strategy that you want to use when thinking about approaching a funder. The source of funds can vary greatly, as can the amount of money available in any given program. And of greatest concern to you as an applicant, the motivation for giving or their philosophy or mission for that giving should be understood when approaching funders. So we'll talk about some broad categories of funders here, charitable foundations, um, corporate foundations, both of these are types of private funders, and then we'll talk about government agency, which, agencies, which I would characterize as public funders. They usually have specific programs that are funded by taxpayer dollars, and their rules and opportunities are regulated and um, responsible to lawmakers. So in the charitable sector or the private foundation sector, foundations are the 
largest type of organization that you're going to find. Um, foundations are generally grouped into different types and may reflect some generalized priorities and granting philosophies based on the type of foundations that they um, are. An independent foundation, or sometimes called professional foundations, are the big ones, the ones that you might hear on the radio or public television, like the Ford Foundation, the Gates Foundation, the Crest Foundation, or Mellon Foundation. These foundations generally have large budgets, they employ a professional program staff, they have a board of directors, and these foundations account for the largest percentage of funds given out by foundations, approximately 50% across the board. So these organizations are going to be ones that you can find on the web, they will have publicized programs, they will have outlined application processes, and they will provide information about how you can apply. They may also include um, some smaller family foundations. These smaller foundations uh, make up the largest number of private foundations in the US. They're generally ones that are set up by a family or a donor to route financial contributions to a particular cause or group that the family is cared about. These foundations, also called operating foundations, are generally smaller and make fewer grants and may be focused on particular purposes. In general, there is a high amount of variation in their procedures and processes to apply. The last type of foundation support that I will mention are community foundations. These organizations generally give funds to support work in a particular community or area. So they don't necessarily have a particular disciplinary focus or a particular giving focus, but to improve some aspect of life in a particular area. Now the data on this slide comes from the Foundation Center and um, I, I have it on this slide to just remind you that um, particularly in the arts, this is an important sector to pay attention to if you're looking for funding. In 2017, according to this data, there were nearly 120,000 foundations in the US and although they often only give a small percentage of funds to arts and performance work, if you look at the right on the bar chart there, you'll notice that arts and culture are still one of the largest areas of general support from these funders. So if you consider that these organizations are giving an estimated $82 billion annually, that suggests about six or seven billion are going toward arts and culture projects. So this is definitely an area that you want to be paying attention to. Let's look at a couple of examples. Here's the website of the Kresge Foundation, which is an independent professional foundation. Uh, they have an interest in Michigan as well as in promoting certain areas of work related to arts and culture. And you can see that they've described particular priorities in their grant making on this slide. And you can read more about what they want to support through each of those areas on their website. Here's the website of the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation, which has made a number of um, priority awards toward arts and culture over the past uh, decade in the Ann Arbor area. So if you're at the University of Michigan, uh, you might be doing work that could be connected to the community, and this might be an organization that you want to think about. Now let's switch to talking about government funders. In the government sector, the National Endowment for the Arts, an independent agency that was founded in 1965, is the largest funder at the national level. So I'll be talking a little bit about that. But in general, government funding entities are set up to route taxpayer funds to support specific initiatives that serve the public interest. In federal entities, these funds are appropriated by Congress, but agency heads and staff set priorities and manage a systematic review process to evaluate each application to the agency. Funding tends to be very competitive because they receive a large amount of applications and only have a small amount of funds to award, but they are highly prestigious awards and can be very valuable for the amount of attention that it can bring to a project. Applications for these types of awards can take a long time to prepare, um, it takes a while to apply, and it can take an even longer time to receive word about whether or not an application should be funded. That said, grants are often complex projects that may span multiple years and um, may employ multiple people through different phases of a project. 
the NEA, uh, their, uh, a graphic of theirs is seen here on this slide, um, is an example of a government funder and it supports expressive culture through competitive grants to individuals, to organizations, and to state level organizations. So if you're thinking about seeking funding from a funder like this, you want to understand what they do. The NEA describes its mission as one that gives Americans the opportunity to participate in the arts, exercise their imaginations, and develop creative capacities. So you can see they have a broad mission that supports the arts generally and its connection to social life in the United States. Note, however, that the NEA only narrowly supports the creation of new art and awards to individuals. Largely, the funding of the current NEA goes towards increasing arts appreciation, towards understanding the arts impact on social life in the US, and toward empirical research to measure and identify the contributions of the arts across society. At the state level, you'll find other government funders. Here is the Michigan Council on Arts and Cultural Affairs. Their grants support a variety of costs from basic operations to support for arts focused programming at organizations and range from a few thousand dollars up to 50 or 60,000. They uh, also follow a peer review process um, and consider impact and benefit to communities, quality of the project and artistic excellence. Once you've um, started looking for different kinds of grants or support, uh, you may find funders that fit into one of these different categories. And remember that anytime you start looking for funding, you wanna do research to understand where the funder is coming from, because that's going to influence the kind of review that you will receive and the kind of things that you want to emphasize in your proposal. To search for grants, there are a number of resources available um, at the university. Um, so this is one portion of the presentation that might not be as easily available to, to you if you are not currently affiliated with the university. However, um, at the left, you'll find a library guide that outlines some sources of funding for graduate students uh, across all disciplines at the university that is publicly available. Um, I would also recommend if you're looking for grants, start with your immediate social connections, start with your mentors, start with your teachers, um, start with your friends and colleagues, find out who they have, if they have um, sought funding, who have they sought funding from. Um, that can kind of start to get you an idea of, of the general um, types of organizations and general funding categories that you may want to keep in mind as you're looking. Um, and uh, that social network can be a good place to start. As you expand your search for funding, there are a number of different databases that you may want to consult. Um, in general, uh, if you're looking for any kind of um, monetary support for your awards, there's a database called Pivot. Um, that is a paid resource. You have to subscribe to it. But if you are a University of Michigan affiliate, you'll be able to log in through the university library's website and set up a search there. Um, for federal funding, you can also check out the publicly and freely available resource grants.gov, which announces all of the grant opportunities that are made available by federal agencies. There are hundreds of them across the entire government. And if you're looking for foundation funding, you may want to check the foundation directory. That is also available for login if you are a University of Michigan affiliate. If not, it is a subscription resource. Finally, just a quick note on the types of funding that you might seek. Um, generally, grants are funds that go to an organization to fund a specific project that has specific personnel, a timeline, and specific outcomes. These are often um, complicated projects that have complex applications and are critically evaluated by groups of peer reviewers. Um, these are typically government funds that are awarded through grants. Um, similarly, cooperative agreements and contracts are other mechanisms that might be used to award funds. Um, grants are probably going to be the largest category of government funds that you'll be seeking um, in the arts and culture area. Uh, there are other types of funds that may be of higher interest to you if you're seeking support for individual work scholarships, 
fellowships, residencies, and prizes are typically um, awards that go toward individuals. Scholarships tend to support a specific project or support tuition or um, defray costs for a particular um, educational project. Fellowships support individuals to undertake specific work at a specified place and time. And generally, the activities are agreed upon in advance, but details are left to you, the applicant. Um, and finally, residencies are arrangements that support a person to be in residence at a place for the purpose of working on art or delivering instruction or other purposes. Generally, the outcomes here are defined in advance, um, or there may be no specific outcome. But the benefit of the time is the time spent on the project and the time uh, and the benefit to the audience or organization that is hosting you um, in the relationship that is created during that time. Prizes are awards that incentivize individuals and often involve monetary awards. However, they, um, although they sometimes are things that you can be nominated for, they're also often um, more of a closed process, um, whereas scholarships, fellowships, and residencies are typically things that you do apply for. Now let's turn to look at some strategies to develop proposals. Um, I'll talk about a few different things here. Um, a lot of these are along the lines of doing background research on the funder. We've already talked about some of the types of funders and types of funding that you might be looking for. That can help to sort of uh, conceptualize your search. Um, but you want to learn everything you can about the funding opportunity as well, if, if there's a specific funding opportunity you're looking for. You want to know your audience, which means understand who is going to be reading your grant proposal. Um, if possible, you want to engage with program staff or people from a funding agency to talk to them about what you want to do and see how it fits with their priorities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about preparing work samples and what to do when you hear back from a funder. To start off, think about um, some of the um, considerations for a proposal. Um, a proposal to a funding opportunity can be a large investment of time and resources on your part. So you do want to think before um, you send out an application or take the time to prepare it about whether or not it's a good fit. Always think about this return on investment or ROI. Um, think about whether it's going to benefit um, or the benefit of potentially receiving the award really is going to justify the amount of time and resources it's going to take you to complete a competitive application. Some things to think about here are um, when you're looking at a particular um, opportunity, figure out what the program supports. Are there things that are not allowed or do those things fit with the kinds of activities that you're proposing to do? Um, are there maximum or minimum amounts that you can request? Um, and how much has the funder uh, allocated to award through a given opportunity? This can give you an idea of how competitive a particular opportunity is and how much you might be able to ask for. Think also about whether or not you're eligible to apply. Check very closely to determine whether only organizations can apply or if individuals can apply. Um, if it's an organization, your organization might need to meet certain requirements, um, like a nonprofit status or something like that. Consider how the application um, is processed and evaluated, um, what materials are required to be submitted and how they will be submitted. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And as you're looking at this as a, an entire package, think about how long the application may take to prepare. And um, beyond that, how long might it take the funder to decide whether or not your application would be funded? In some cases, you'll be waiting a year or many months before you hear from a funder. If you are working on a time-sensitive project, it may not be a wise investment of your time to take a six-month um, span of time to work on an application and then send off an application that you might hear back from in a year and two years down the road you'll know whether or not you're going to be funded. If it's something that's quicker, this might not be a good thing to invest time in. And finally, think about whether the possible results justify the amount of work that are going to be required to prepare and plan a proposal. That is the ROI, the return on investment. 
So if you're looking at a particular funding opportunity, you want to do your homework and look into the funder's mission, priorities, and programs. Ways to do this include looking at their mission statements, looking for org charts, seeing what their staff looks like. Look for the things that they have funded previously. Most um, professional foundations and government funders have databases that you can search to see what types of projects have been funded previously. If they're available, you want to make sure you read the funding program descriptions in detail, mark them up and note exactly the kinds of things that you need and look at all those eligibility requirements, limits, etc. If possible, you want to read materials from previously funded applications and sample proposals. Some funders make these available. If you don't see any available, look to see if you know anyone who's been funded by a funder in the past and see if you can talk to them about the process. You can find this type of information in a number of different places. Um, agency or organization websites are a good place to start. Look for their annual reports, strategic plans, reports or publications that they've uh, supported, press releases, or as I said earlier, um, particularly for government funders, look for their funded projects database, which gives you a view into what they've funded in the past. So let's take a look at how you might um, think about this if you're applying for a specific opportunity. So if you are looking at a specific program, for example, NEA Arts Projects, which is a current grant program that's run through the National Endowment for the Arts, you want to start by reading the program description. And when you're working on the application, always keep in mind that you want to respond to the program description in as much detail as possible. These, two, these are two basic principles that um, are so basic sometimes people really forget them. But if you don't follow them, um, you're going to have a weaker application. Um, you want to make sure you're really responding to the program description. In the case of federal funders, there's a lot of information that's available. So the screenshot here illustrates uh, part of the guidelines for the NEA's Arts Projects program. And when you read through this, you'll find out that these are the most numerous of the NEA's awards. They're a minimum of $10,000 and can range up to $100,000, but the average award is twenty dollars to $30,000. You'll also find out that these grants require a one-to-one -one cost share, which means that if you ask for $10,000 from the NEA, you also have to bring $10,000 to support part of the project. So that's going to be a significant investment from the applicant side. So effectively, the grant isn't going to cover more than 50% of any single project something very important to keep in mind. Uh, you'll also find out that generally projects can last from a minimum of six months up to 24 months, so half a year to two years. Information on the NEA's website also explains what the review process looks like. Um, all the applications to the NEA are reviewed by panels of peer reviewers, so people who understand the discipline or types of work that you're proposing to do. So they're going to be experts in the types of things you're proposing to do. However, they also include at least one layperson on each panel who's going to be a knowledgeable individual, but not necessarily from a discipline. Applications to these programs are submitted according to artistic discipline, which corresponds um, to, a diff to different sectors. I'll talk about those in a moment. And although the program has two deadlines annually, not every discipline or sector is open at each deadline. So if you're looking at a particular thing, say in visual arts, you want to make sure that application deadline is open um, at the time that you're planning to apply. The NEA evaluates its applications according to artistic merit and artistic excellence. These, quali these qualities and criteria are outlined in detail in the funding solicitation when you read through it. So as you're creating a strategy to present um, your project to the funder, you want to consider these two factors most highly. In the excellence category, you want to pay special attention to the project personnel, what they've done in the past, how highly recognized they are in their fields, and what the organizations that may be involved with the project bring to it. Uh, barring other factors, a history of success and activity are going to carry weight um, in that excellence category. 
Under artistic merit, attention may be paid to the way that you describe the importance of the project to the intended audience, the appropriateness of the resources that you're proposing you need to carry out the project, and there may be more broad factors, such as the way in which the project will celebrate American creativity and advance respectful dialogue or community healing or enrich humanity generally. Many projects are also evaluated on whether they reach underserved communities or how they strengthen the arts. And so you want to learn about, if that's the criteria that's mentioned, learn about what they mean, how they define underserved communities, and how they understand uh, strengthening the arts to operate. The principal grant program of the NEA, which is arts projects that we were just discussing, awards most of the project's grants. Um, and the applications are reviewed according to these sectors. So they include things like dance, design, folk arts, literature, media arts, museums, music, theater, and visual arts. So keep in mind that when they are asking about artistic merit and artistic excellence, those categories and the way that's evaluated will be determined by reviewers who are recruited according to these different areas. So it's critical that you think about how your proposal may address any one of these areas. This image also foregrounds a key priority of the NEA, which is to forward research and support work that shows how the arts are integrated throughout American life. Thus, they are interested in supporting work that can be understood within a particular arts area, but specifically how it might connect to other sectors like community health, economy, um, education, transportation, or other sectors. Each application to the NEA is evaluated by a peer review panel. This is a common process at some professional funders, and it's definitely a process you will find at other government funders. Keep in mind that some proposals might follow other processes, but it's always important to understand who the audience you're writing to is. So in the case of the NEA, the thing to keep in mind here is that your main audience is the peer reviewers. So for the most part, the peer review process can be generalized at the NEA into these four steps. For most applications, um, uh, there is an initial step of intake and program review where the staff will consider whether or not the application is eligible and it meets all the criteria for, for the program that you're applying to. So that's a kind of initial technical step. The second step is the peer review process. Um, the NEA establishes grant proposal or grant panels that will review uh, each application, and these panels are are uh, required to reflect diversity in geography, race, and ethnicity, as well as in artistic approach or method in a given artistic discipline. And as I mentioned earlier, each panel includes a knowledgeable layperson. So remember that you will not necessarily be speaking only to artists or creators who are directly familiar with your practice or medium. You'll be speaking to a broad audience. Neither agency maintains standing panels. So if you resubmit an application in a future uh, round, it's unlikely to be read by the same reviewers. So you might receive comments from one panel that may or may not be important to the next group. But uh, generally, if you receive uh, comments on your application and it isn't funded, you want to address those as closely as possible so you can bring it back in the next round. After the peer review step, each of these agencies has a presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed board of individuals called the National Council. Um, they will also review applications and receive the recommendations and outcome of the peer review process as it's prepared by the staff of the agency. And then finally, each agency has a chairperson who will be the final person to make decisions on whether a project is funded. So this is a specific process to the NEA, but the peer review process at other funders may follow some of the patterns here um, and in any case where you're dealing with a peer review process, remember that these reviewers are your main audience. So you want to be reflecting a writing and thinking about writing a reviewer centric proposal. It can be a little bit of a frustrating prospect to think about your audience uh, that is going to include generalists. Um, 
it's a con but it's a consideration that you may need to keep in mind uh, for any publicly funded agency or organizations. In the case of private funders, you may need to investigate the review process to find out how it operates there. The illustration here is Ken Jeong, who's a judge on the television show The Masked Singer, where the panel's job is to guess the identity of a celebrity who's singing underneath a mask. Most of the judges are musicians, but Ken is not, and he often makes somewhat off-the-mark comments, although they're occasionally on point. So he might be the kind of person that you imagine giving comments on your application if you're thinking of this knowledgeable layperson. Someone who's generally informed and probably sensitive to what you want to do, but who probably doesn't have a great familiarity with the details of where you're coming from. So remember, you want to write at a general level, at an approachable and friendly tone, and something that can be understood um, by someone who may not have a lot of perspective on your particular discipline. As you're thinking about your application, um, you want to think about exactly how you're going to answer the questions that the funders are going to be asking. So in the case of the NEA, for example, this artistic excellence and artistic merit are specific criteria that you want to be writing toward. Because when those reviewers are reading the application, the staff of the agency are going to be asking specifically, you know, how does it, uh, how does it, stack up on this question of artistic merit? Is this a project that can happen and be carried out reasonably? Um, you want to think about these as kind of the five W's, right? Who, what, why, where, and when. You want to answer all of those basic questions in your application. Um, think about the questions kind of as this left-hand column, answering questions like, why does it matter? What are you going to do? Who is going to do it? When will you do it? Um, and then how effectively will you be managing financial resources? Each one of these questions can be fit into the specified application elements that you're going to be required to fill out if you're filling out the application. So why does it matter is a question you definitely want to answer in the abstract and narrative sections. So the abstract is kind of your mini like elevator pitch about the proposal. The narrative is the full deal, uh, the full explanation of what you want to do. Um, for the NEA, think about uh, in the artistic excellence category, addressing the significance of the project, your record as a creator. In the merit category, um, think about how the project might deepen or extend appreciation of the arts and what potential impact it might have on the community. The other kind of um, important questions about what you're doing, who's doing it, when you're doing it, and how much it costs are the things that you're going to be um, answering in the plan, timeline, personnel bios, facilities uh, descriptions, assessment methods that you're proposing, or the work samples. So those are the specific application elements to think about there. And the types of questions that you might be addressing in the artistic excellence category are, you're demonstrating the quality of the artists. You're demonstrating the stability of the organizations. You're demonstrating their importance as educators, the artworks that they produced, or the services that they provide. On the merit side of the coin, you will be answering questions um, like, how clearly are you expressing the project goals? What are the project goals? Um, they will ask about the clarity that they're expressed with. How is the project designed? What resources are need? Who are the project personnel? And how appropriate are any evaluations or assessments that they've proposed? And finally, um, on the financial resources side, you will be asked to prepare a budget. So you want to know exactly what's allowed or not allowed in terms of uh, things that you can request funds for that may have a lot of rules around it um, in a federal grant application. Other funders may have different rules. Um, and as you're looking at that in the NEA rubric, the artistic merit question there is appropriateness or reasonableness of the budget. So make sure that you can clearly draw any costs that you're claiming back to the core uh, of the project. 
Keep in mind that while the terminology of funders and structures of applications can change, there will be common elements and points of evaluation that you need to address regardless of where your application may be headed. So thinking through the project with the high level questions in the far left column, the who, what, why, and when, um, will be questions you need to answer in all applications and you need to think about how you can modify or fit those into uh, the specific funding opportunity that you're going to pursue. I won't say a lot about connecting staff, but remember that the funder is a resource to you. You want to contact your friends, colleagues, and mentors, but only the staff or representatives of the funder have all the information about a competition. If you have questions, they are there to answer them. That said, be strategic. If you want to propose a question or meet with a funder, list out your questions in advance. Make sure you can show them that you value their time and feedback um, by showing that you understand the funding opportunity, you have a clear understanding of what you want to do, and think of every conversation that you might have with the staff as a chance to build understanding and advocacy for your project. Things that you might want to think about asking are the specifics of the program. Um, also ask about whether or not your proposed project fits well with their current priorities. You can ask if the project seems like a good fit for the program or if there's dedicated resources that they have in other funding lines for specific activities that you're proposing. Or in, in some cases, they may be aware of other programs or funders that also fund work like you um, want to do. Before you ask any questions, make sure that you do determine someone from your project team who will be the primary contact. If you have multiple people working on your project, you don't want to have questions coming to a funder from all over the place about the same project. It can be confusing um, and it doesn't present your project in the best light. You want to do your background research so you're not asking questions that are already answered on their website or program documents and try to group your questions so you can be as efficient as possible in the conversation. There's going to be a lot of people asking them questions, so make sure you show them that you value their time. Remember that every interaction with the funder is a chance to build a relationship and you want that to be a relationship of respect and one in which the staff can better understand your goals and qualifications so as your application is being considered throughout the process, they can advocate for it most effectively and understanding um, what you want to do. Given the nature of arts-focused projects, many applications may require supplemental materials. There are two main categories to think about. Supplementary materials like letters of recommendation, reviews, or other testimonials, things that you can add to the application uh, as appendices, and work samples. These are things that provide examples of your work that might be supported in a project, things like a recording, pictures of a work in performance, or examples of your previous work. These can be highly complex and vary quite a lot according to the disciplines that you're working in. An actor, for example, may need a headshot, not a work sample, as well as a high quality recording of a live performance. A visual arts project might require high resolution presentation images of work, as well as examples of where the work is located or uh, other contextual information. A composer might need a detailed score, as well as an audio recording of a performance. The varieties can be complicated and are quite infinite. So in this slide, I've provided a few things for you to think about. If you're preparing a project, make sure that you pay close attention to this aspect of the application, particularly if you're asking for resources to do more work that you like you've already done. So you do exhibitions or you mount live performances. It's important to demonstrate to the funder that you can do this successfully. The notes to this slide include links to sample NEA guidelines for preparing certain types of media products, as well as materials from a seminar by the Indianapolis Arts Council that details supplemental materials according to arts disciplines. Once you've pulled everything together and you've got your application together, you want to um, kind of go through a final checklist, re-review the guidelines, make sure that you've answered all their questions and followed the guidelines, um, make sure you don't miss the deadline, so have that marked on your calendar and make sure you're working backward from the deadline. Have at least one other person check the materials if you can to make sure that they look good, that they're complete, um, that you've proofread them. 
And if you are working with an organization, make sure you know before the day of the application who's going to submit the materials. Um, it may not be you. There might be a person who submits in a university at the sponsored projects office, or if you work with a nonprofit, there may be another person who has uh, the sort of financial authority to do these things on behalf of an organization. So make sure you understand that process. Finally, hopefully you've got all of your things together, everything's arranged, ready to go, submit it, and then try not to think about it for a while. Even a simple application can take a lot of time and work to create and finalize, and once it's ready, you just wanna get it out the door and move on to your next uh, project. You'll have other things that you wanna work on. So don't spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not it was good or wasn't good or rereading and looking for typos. You will hear from the funder in due time. They may ask you questions. Um, don't try to overthink it. Just wait for them to get back to you and then worry about it when they do. Finally, a couple pieces of advice about when you receive a funding decision. Hopefully you receive good news, but it's also highly likely that you may not receive good news. In that case, you do wanna practice resilience. Consider that in the arts, in some competitions, only five to 10% of applications are routinely funded. So it means not receiving funding doesn't mean that you don't have a good project. It just means that you didn't um, get over the bar this particular time. There are some specific actions you might wanna to take to practice resilience as well. So I would say if you get the bad news, first you wanna take a moment, you know, phone a friend, vent to a colleague, and don't share all of that with a funder. Take a day or two to process a rejection or as much as you need. I have worked as a funder and I've received angry emails about decisions and it doesn't, doesn't typically help to build a valuable relationship. Um, and if you wanna go back to the funder, you wanna make sure that you are able to cultivate that relationship. Whether or not you're funded, always see what information you can get about the decision. Again, federal funders will typically provide written comments from peer reviewers, which you can read and help to inform your ideas about whether to revise and resubmit a proposal. In the arts and humanities, because of the funding levels, be ready to feel like you don't necessarily feel like you get a clear reason from the comments. Uh, the funding is scarce and there's often not a better reason than that there just wasn't money available and certain priorities came into play to decide which applications got the money. In those cases, though, all is not lost. Think about ways that you could frame the proposal more convincingly within that funder's framework or within another funder's framework. You can talk to the staff if they're available to talk to you after, the, uh, after you've had your decompression period. Um, is there any way to make this project shine or get better attention from the reviewers? If you're thinking about reapplying, ask the funder what would happen to a subsequent proposal, whether it would be read by the same people or whether there is other things that you wanna think about changing as you're updating the proposal. Also consider whether or not you might be able to take it to another funder. Um, perhaps it could be a better fit. And finally, take a few moments to think about what you can gain from the proposal process, whether or not you've been funded. The amount of planning and work that it takes to assemble a proposal like this is significant and any ways that you can reuse the materials that you can assemble uh, or reuse the ideas that you've put together in the proposal can be really valuable as you take uh, your work into its next phase. The slide deck for this presentation offers a list of some further resources on slide number 36. And I'll close the, uh, presenta the recorded presentation with a list of some of these final resources. There's no Q&A in this recorded presentation. However, following the session, you can send questions to me by email directly. My email is here on this slide. Um, and these slides are available for anyone to access on the web. And the link to these slides is here on this slide. Um, it has a short link myumi.ch slash nbdmr. And you'll be able to look at these slides and see any of the notes that I've provided for each slide. In many cases, there are links to other resources and places that you can uh, go to learn more about any particular aspect of an application that I've discussed.
I hope that this presentation has been useful to you in providing a framework for thinking about the funders and types of funding that might be available to you working on an expressive project. And I also hope that our walk through the um, application process and application guidelines for the NEA programs um, have been illustrative of the types of things that you'll want to be thinking about as you're working on an application. If you are working on a funding application, I wish you good luck and I hope that this presentation has been of use. Thanks very much, everybody.